Hi, good morning. Um, so, you might possibly have wondered what I'm talking about in the title of this talk. I'm going to be talking a lot in the context of this particular diagram. On the left is you hacking away on your local machine. On the right is your production service running for you in the cloud. And I suspect that many of us are in this situation. How that code hacked on the left ends up running on the right is going to vary a lot between us, though. Some will push a git commit and wait for continuous deployment to take the code through all the various acceptance stages. And I'm sure some of you are still just manually copying the code to a remote machine. But I believe there's, there's one invariant here. If something fails when it's actually running in production, it's a bigger deal than if it fails on your local machine. It's more costly to you. You're going to spend more time debugging it. And it's probably more costly to others, too, in terms of service downtime. In this talk, I'm going to be talking about some nice and hopefully generally applicable patterns we found for increasing confidence in our deployment. But before that, I'll, I'll mention a little bit about me so you know where I'm coming from. Despite the focus of this talk, I'm, I'm really not an ops person, but I am a Go enthusiast, however. When, when Go came out in 2011, I, I jumped on that wagon instantly. It, it scratched a bunch of my itches. It was fast, easy to use, and, and simple. But there are, there are still definitely some itches it doesn't seem to scratch, and configuration seems to be one of them. Although we can write nice Go struct type definitions that represent our configuration, I, I often find myself writing more code than I'd like to, to wrangle it, to, to check invariants that aren't expressible with struct tags. When I, when I encountered the Q language a few years ago, I, I realized this could be a, a perfect complement to Go. And back, back to this diagram, it, it, it would be nice to think that our world is as simple as this diagram, but it's really not. We work in a world where there are multiple people, probably multiple pipelines. The way I see it, it's more like each developer is in the center of a fan. Instead of left to right, we're talking close and far away. The further away we get from you at the center, the more costly a failure is. And pipelines aren't necessarily linear either. Our code quite probably ends up deployed to multiple regions in different places. There are often overlapping concerns between different phases too. For example, we want to be sure that the configuration values a binary is started with are compatible with the configuration that's actually expected by that binary. That there's actually no one single place, actually, where all the information is known. Some configuration is, is late binding, and secrets are a good example of that. We know that we will require it and what form it should take, but the actual value isn't known and, until the service is actually running. So how do we gain some confidence that things are going to work OK in deployment? Well, firstly, we're using Go, we can compile our code. Go has a fantastic, simple, but powerful type system. It can catch many errors before we even run the code. We write tests, and those tests are generally the same ones that run in CI, although they may run on different platforms, and, and there might be some static checks that one might have forgotten to run locally. Once the code's landed after your CI checks, perhaps you have a staged deployment system where maybe we run the code in an entirely different staging environment, or perhaps we run both co versions of the code and route only a little bit of traffic to the new version at first. Once the new code is fully running, we probably have some health checks and monitoring to give us confidence that the code really is running OK in production. But as a last resort, well, if we don't hear anything from our users, we're probably all right. But, but there's a gap. If your situation is similar to other places I've worked, none of the early stages of our confidence building will give you that much confidence that the configuration that will be passed to your Go program will be OK. The Go type system and your local tests give us confidence that if 
If the right configuration is provided, our program will work as expected. But how do we gain confidence that that's actually going to happen? Again, CI, we don't have much more to work with. We don't have the actual configuration there. It's only when we start to get into the actual and expensive deployment phase that we start to find out if the configuration is bad. And even then, we're not necessarily good. It's not uncommon to have an entirely separate staging environment with its own settings acting as a gateway to deployment in the real production environment. But then there's still room for the production configuration to be bad. And what do I mean when I say we, we don't have confidence in our configuration? What kinds of bad things can happen? I mean, our configuration data can just be plain wrong. Maybe we've provided an integer where a string is expected, misspelled a field name, or provided a value that's out of bounds. Or our configuration can be inconsistent across our services. Perhaps they're passing incompatible messages to one another. Perhaps we've got a global policy that's not consistently being enforced. Uh, also, as developers, we can write configuration that's wrong just because we don't fully understand what's required. So much configuration, I see, is documented just by example or informal description. And even if we have tools for helping with all the above, we still face a problem if the bad configuration or inconsistency occurs later on in your pipeline. So what do we actually want here? I, I, I want as much early warning of problems as possible before I actually start deploying the service. The further left we can see those problems, the better. And I'd like to see consistency between configurations across services in the same deployment. If two services are talking to one another, we don't want them to agree on how to talk. If we change some global policy, we'd like it to automatically apply across all our services. I want it to be straightforward for people writing different services to be able to collaborate with one another at review time. That is, there should be clear, machine-checkable API contracts rather than vague user-written documentation. And I'd like to see all the above even in the face of the fact that our configuration data might come from different places and at different times. So one common way to gain some confidence in the consistency of your configuration is to generate it with some tool. And JSON is kind of a popular choice here. Rather, I mean, we, d we don't like editing YAML or JSON files directly. This allows us to generate configuration that feeds into an entire deployment, ensuring consistency across services as a result of using the same source of truth for all of it. But this approach generally has some limitations. It's hard to know that what we've generated is truly consistent with what our Go code expects. We haven't got an explicit representation of the schemas involved, meaning it's harder to collaborate with other people and other services. Perhaps they might be written in other languages. All the configuration is generated at one time, but we don't necessarily have all the information at that time. Again, secrets, a good example of that. We'd like a shot to have assurance for that too. So to reiterate the what do we want slide, configuration generation on its own doesn't seem to tick too many of the boxes. Although we get consistency across services, the other points aren't really addressed. By way of illustration, I'll mention an incident that happened at a previous place of work not so long ago. We were using GitOps, that is, all the changes were gated through code review. We could see both the changes to the code that was generating the configuration and the resulting YAML, but nonetheless, we one day woke up to find that an entire region's deployment had been removed, all gone. Um, a combination of inheritance-based semantics and lack of sanity constraints across our deployment meant that all the settings for that region had just been erased. Luckily for us, the persistent data stores remained, so after a day of restoration work with a bunch of people pitching in, it was all restored. But at significant cost, to the company in terms of uptime guarantees 
and lost productivity. Well, I work full time on Q, um, and of course, you know, I wanted to eat our own dog food. So I'm going to describe to you something of what we've done, and I'm actually really happy by how it turned out. I'll, ha I'll try and highlight some of the general techniques as they arise, but also I'm a strong believer in the power of specific detail to convey deeper understanding. So this talk is going to be strong on detail, lighter on philosophy. I'll be including actual code snippets so you get some idea what things might look like in practice. So I'm sure many of you haven't actually come across Q before, or perhaps you've heard someone talk about it without actually using it yourself. So what exactly is Q? I mean, it's a language. It's actually a direct superset of JSON. All JSON is valid Q, and as a result, the underlying data model is substantially the same as JSON's. It has strings, numbers, bool, null, objects, and arrays. A lot of the design is Go-influenced. Uh, it's probably no coincidence that Marcel van Hoeysen, Q's designer, was working as part of the Go team when he designed Q. So if you know Go, you recognize some of the syntax. And Q is implemented in Go too, and also the Go API for implementing Q is super nice. The, uh, the computation model in Q is really different from any language, any other language I've used. I've heard it's more akin to logic programming languages than anything else, but that doesn't do it justice. It, I find its semantics are really well aligned with the domain, and once you get used to it, it feels really intuitive too. Types are first-class values, which is weird, but cool. We can use Q to define templates, schemas, and pure data structures. Now, I'm not going to try to describe the language features all at once. Instead, I'll introduce it by a bunch of examples. I'm leaving out substantial parts of the language, but I'm hopefully including enough that you can get a feel for it and how it can be used. Now, a big part of Q is the tooling around it, which is really versatile. I've heard the Q tool described as a Swiss army knife of configuration. It can do a bunch of stuff. And by that, um, when I say Swiss army knife, I mean at one level at least, Q appears to do many different things. But on another, they're all strongly related, bound together by a common abstraction. Just like any good tool, these basic primitives can be put to many uses with which I'll f explore a few in these talk. The possibilities are limited by our own, only by our own imagination. So to enumerate some of those sort of fundamental capabilities, Q can validate your configuration. You can use Q as a gate to check that your configuration looks correct in whatever way you care about. It can generate your configuration. You can use Q to generate the YAML or JSON configuration that feeds into your deployment. Q can translate between different configuration formats. It natively understands JSON and YAML and some other formats and can easily translate between them. You can see it as a kind of lingua franca of configuration formats. Q can compose configurations together. That is, you can take Q configuration from different sources and merge them together in a predictable and intuitive way. We also call this unification. This is arguably Q's secret source and the key to so much of why it's useful. So to demonstrate, I'm going to describe an example. It differs in detail from our actual deployment, but the essence is kind of similar. To give some context, this is a rough sketch of how the deployment might look when the services are deployed. We've got services deployed to several different regions. Each service runs an image that it pulls from a container. Some services use the same image, just with different runtime parameters. All these services send log messages to a logging server and use a secret auth token to make that secure. But I'm going to start by narrowing that context considerably. I'm going to talk about writing and deploying one single program, one I'm guessing most people here will be familiar with, an API server. That is. It's just 
serving HTTP requests by listening on a network call port, and it will optionally send log messages to another server. Well, I know most such services log by writing to a file, but imagine this is a placeholder for any other deployment level dependency a service might wish to talk to. As I mentioned on the previous slide, although we'll only be looking at one program, we'll want to deploy it as a service in several different scenarios, perhaps in different regions, perhaps locally, and in the context of other services too. And its configuration will vary accordingly. So hold on to your hats. I'm going to throw loads of code to you at this talk in the hope that seeing concrete code examples is more helpful than waffly slides. Hopefully, there's enough context that you'll be able to get the gist, even if you don't grok everything. But regardless, you can pull the full example code from this repo to play with it afterwards, uh, when I've actually pushed some code. <laughs> well, um, so we might know how to, write an, how to write an HTTP server, but there's still a detail that needs to be decided on. How will our Go program receive its configuration? Common options include parsing command line flags and arguments, getting environment variables, reading YAML or JSON from disk. Uh, I've seen service implementations accept all three with some complicated precedence rules to choose between them. But honestly, from my point of view, when I'm writing the service, I, I don't think I should have to care how the configuration is presented. All I really care about is that we get it and that it's got the right values in it. So as a straw man, I'm going to start by defining our configuration as a simple struct type that we can unmarshal into from JSON. Having a single type that describes the full configuration accepted by the service seems like a nice thing to have, and, and it's typed, which is more than can be said for environment variables or command line program arguments. At least that gives us one easy route to getting the configuration into our program. We could open a JSON configuration file and use encoding JSON to read into it. So here's how we're going to start. Our program will listen on a local TCP port, which we've called listen port here. And if logging is enabled, it will expect an associated value holding all the logging configuration. Hopefully, this is you know, fairly, fairly standard looking to most of you. Of course, any real service would have much more complex configuration with more interesting interactions between parts of it, but this should be enough for illustrative purposes. One thing I'll point out, that bold header in bold type where it mentions the, the file name, that's tookstar format, which you might have come across, and I'm using it to describe the contents of the files or the names of the files. Hopefully that makes it a little clearer to see how we arrange the files in this project and thus to make sense of some of the commands that we'll be running. That run service function we see the signature of there, well, that'll actually run our service given the configuration that's pa been passed in. I'm not going to write out the actual Go code body of that. Hopefully you'll have some, some idea of how you might write such a function and how we could read a configuration file, unmarshal it as JSON into that config type and pass it to run service there. So now it's time to apply one of Q's Swiss Army Knife capabilities, translation. But first, we need the Q command line tool, which we'll install here. You'll only need to do that once. We've got binaries available for different platforms. Then we create a Q module file. Not unlike Go, this enables us to import between different packages inside our Q code. Now we're going to import the Go type that we've just defined into Q by running Q get Go. Now this is an absolutely crucial step. This is how we're going to be able to use our actual Go code as a source of truth, joining the dots between Go and the rest of our configuration. So here we get to see our first actual Q code. Here we see the code that was generated in that previous slide. So there's a lot going on here. I'll try and explain it slowly. First, you can see that the file name mirrors the original Go source file name that defined the types. The package directive 
is also very similar to Go's package directive in more ways than one. Just like Go, Q's packages can be split across multiple files in the same directory. Now things are a little different. Although the type names in Q are similar to the original Go type names, that leading number or hash symbol indicates that the associated code is a definition rather than a regular data value. By convention, we treat these as schemas rather than data. And here, like in JSON, the braces indicate a struct or object type, and we can see that the fields in it reflect the JSON struct tags in the Go rather than the original Go field names, because we're in sort of JSON world here. Each field in this definition is marked either as required, that's the exclamation marks, or optional, the question marks, meaning that we're not actually defining any fields here, we're just what defining what's allowed or required. You can see that Q has string and bool types, as you might expect from a language that has the JSON data model at its heart. We can see that the logger config field, which is a pointer in Go, has been translated to what we call, often call a disjunction, a set of possible alternatives. Here we can see that the logger field can be omitted entirely, that's the question mark, specified as null, or provided like an explicit null, or provided as a struct. And although technically accurate, that's perhaps not what we actually want. Go tends to use non-null pointer types to represent field presence. We'd likely want the, field, want the field to be omitted rather than provided explicitly as null. Well. Our Go type constraints have entered the Q world now, and luckily, Q's semantics make it trivial to add additional constraints to the de definitions that were just generated. So we've done a bit of that here. We've put an extra definition of config into another file. We've called it config-extra.q. This is the first we've seen of Q's unification capabilities, or merging, or composition capabilities. Instead of erroring out, like Go would, when it sees a duplicate field or definition, Q will unify them, and it will complain loudly if there's any conflict between the two. Uh, for our demonstration here, I've added two new constraints. When logging is enabled with that Boolean, I will require the associated logger config field, fig field to be present and not null. And we've also tightened up the logging level definition, so it allows legitimate log levels. So here, the, the way I've done that here, this here, I've defined an alias. So that allows us to refer to other fields in the same object. Like Go, Q has lexical scope. If you refer to an identifier in an expression, as we're doing here with if config.logging config enabled, that identifier must be defined somewhere in the scope of the expression. This is a super useful property that makes static analysis of Q code much easier, and it also catches loads of errors early on too, just like in Go. The, uh, the, this brace dot 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 syntax says this must be a struct, but it can have any number of fields of any type at all. So in the, we're also constraining the logging level to be one of the known level strings rather than uh, just any, other, any odd string, uh, which was generated from the Go. Note we've got these two levels of colon thing. This is a, a nice shorthand that allows us to admit the otherwise necessary braces around level, because we're actually saying that logger config is still a struct. It's containing this level field. The disjunction here also illustrates one of Q's unusual features, values at actually also types. We can see, for example, the string value debug here as a type that contains only the value debug. So this disjunction allows exactly the string values listed here. All right, so we've defined our configuration schema, so what about the configuration data itself? Let's put that in the deploy directory. This is where I'll put all the configuration that we're going to deploy this program with. Let, let's start by writing it in YAML. I mean, this, this looks good, right? We, we love YAML. 
let's, let's try using Q's uh, validation properties to check it. So here's, here we've got we're running the QVET command, which, like GoVET, is super useful for checking that your queue is well formed. Not only does it check that your queue is syntactically OK, but it also evaluates the queue as much as it can and informs us of any issues. Here, we use the minus C flag to check that the queue is concrete. That is, is it in a form suitable for converting to JSON or YAML? And we ask it to validate using the queue we generated earlier as a schema to check the YAML against. In this case, we incorrectly thought that Y was a Boolean in YAML. How could we? But it turns out it's a string. I guess we're using a different version of YAML than we expected. Let's fix that. OK, the Y is now true. And now it's complaining about the fields that were acquired but not provided, which isn't something generally that easy to do and go without explicitly checking. Let's add those fields that it told us were missing. We're adding the, the, that auth token there. Um, OK, so now it's working. But using YAML as a source of truth like this has limitations, which is why people end up using languages like JSONnet to generate their configuration. We can use Q instead. Before we do, let's recap on where we are on our requirements. We can now get early warning of configuration issues before running the app. We've got an explicit schema, making it clear to collaborators what the contract for this service is. But we've got nothing that ensures consistency between services and no story yet about what happens when configuration data comes from different places. So let's try and specify our configuration in Q instead of YAML. We'll start by writing another definition to keep us straight. This type models all the information that we're going to need to deploy a service running our program. This is a point where collaborators can understand and agree on what's necessary or allowed. We use the service name to name our service when it's running in the cloud. We, we use an image name to name the Docker image we're going to use to run the service. And with this config field will hold this actual configuration data that will be passed to our Go program in the container running that image. Here, the underscore symbol, we also call this top, represents anything at all. Because we're defining something generic across all our services, we can't necessarily say anything about the configuration a given service will expect. OK, let's define some actual configuration data for our service. The, uh, the deploy package here is acting both as a container for the deployment data and the schemas, the definitions that we just saw, that define its shape. Although at first we'll define only the data for one service, we'll want to define configuration for multiple services in multiple regions, so we're catering for that here. We do that by using some syntax I haven't shown so far, a pattern constraint. That's the expression inside the square brackets. It says that for any key that matches the expression, in this case, underscore or top, which will match any key, the constraints on the right will apply. So this says we've got a two-level map, which we're using to express the fact that we've got multiple regions, and each region itself can contain multiple services, each with its own independent configuration. This is an example of a consistency check. We're checking that every element here conforms to the service definition we just wrote. Then we define the data for our one single service instance. We ensure that the configuration data is compatible with the actual schema accepted by the Go program by importing it from the Q package we defined earlier. The import statement works similar to Go's import statement. Just like we did earlier, by defining the config field twice, we ensure that both are unified and any conflicts will be reported. One thing I'll point out, those quotes around the API server key. If, if we didn't do that, then that will be in scope inside the struct and similar to Go would shadow the name of that package that we want to refer to. So now our configuration is all in queue. It's easier to run our validation, less arguments to QVET. 
we can see that we've forgotten to define a bunch of fields. So here's a working example, working definition of a configuration in Q, having added the missing fields. The QVET command will succeed. We can even export it as YAML or JSON. So let's do that here. We've exported the configuration for our service, all vetted against our Go-derived schema as YAML. Job done, right? Well, no, because we really don't want to be checking in secrets into our code. Also, it happens that the source of truth for the port that we'll listen on comes from elsewhere. Darn. So before we go on to fixing that, I think we can say we've ticked off the first item in our requirement list now. We've defined our service configuration in such a way that we can easily have consistency checks across multiple services. So we've realized that perhaps having everything exported to a single JSON or YAML configuration file maybe isn't ideal, as some parts of the configuration come from other sources <coughs> and so aren't yet available. In our case, we're running gcloud, because we're too cheapskate to run do Kubernetes, best practice is to listen on the port provided by the environment variable dollar port. And secrets can also be provided in environment variables. This is all very deployment specific, but can't be avoided. We don't know specific values for these fields when we write the configuration on our laptop. So at this point, we could make our program directly aware of these conventions it would know how to read the port environment variable and the names of the environment variables to read secrets from and how they map to the auth token field required by the logger, which would work, of course, but it doesn't feel quite right to me. We lose on that nice declarative configuration type and the type safety that gives us. Maybe in some circumstances, we're running locally maybe, we don't want to pass the secret in an environment variable, but explicitly in the configuration file. How the configuration arrives in the runtime environment feels like something we should be able to choose depending on where the binary is running. So the solution we chose, which worked out pretty well, was, surprise, surprise, to use Leverage Q's composition capability. Instead of passing the entire configuration as a concrete JSON blob to the service, we actually passed the Q itself, or the Q that's directly relevant to the service. Remember, we don't have yet have values for some of the fields, but that's okay. The configuration is still valid, even though it's not concrete yet. We then merge, or unify that, at runtime with other values acquired from different sources, and we'll require the resulting configuration to be concrete so we can decode it into our Go struct value. So here's what we've chosen as the Q definition of our runtime value. This is what we'll use to model the configuration dependencies that are known only when the service runs. For current purposes, we only need access to environment variables, but the scope is unlimited. You could do more things. We're going to fill this in from the service's runtime environment. The code that we write to do this can do this without doing, knowing anything about the specific service. All we need to do is read the environment variables and fill it in. So now, we can actually bridge the gap between the general runtime information and the actual configuration by defining values in the configuration in terms of that runtime data. So we, we, here we've defined that runtime uh, value, and we're explicitly ex specifying which fields we require, but we're not specifying concrete values for them. This is going to be useful later. So here's how the merging might look with some actual queue. We'll just consider the listen port so this can fit on a slide. So we start off with all the configuration we know about. This will include all the values we know already, but some, va some values, like listen port in this case, we don't know them yet. So we'll just have the queue we wrote before. The connection between the runtime values and that configuration key is maintained. Then. We create this runtime information. This is going to happen when we're actually running the service. There are clearly going to be more environment variables than just port, but that's the one we care about here. Then we merge 
or unify the two. Just like defining two fields at the same time as we did before, the two merge into one thing, automatically filling out the relevant piece of configuration. So let's actually try to do that now, just to demonstrate. We can use QDEF to extract just the piece of configuration that pertains to the service itself. QDEF is a little bit like QExport, but it produces Q with all the constraints intact rather than concrete data. As with QExport, we've got this minus E flag that gives the expression that's evaluated to produce the result. And this inline imports flag says we want a self-contained result that doesn't need to import the API server package for its definitions. So we can look at it, we'll put the result in a temporary file. So here's the result, well, as much as will fit on this slide. It, it's slightly odd looking as it's been automatically produced and there's definitely some room for simplification here, but it's recognizably the same configuration we had before. It's not entirely concrete yet as there are no runtime values available, but if we do get some runtime values and we merge them in, we should get some nice concrete data suitable for use by Go. Let's check our sum assumptions by doing that. First, let's create a file containing that runtime information. This is simulating what will be done at runtime on the service itself. Now we can use QExport to dump the unified result as YAML. We can see that the, both the listen port and auth token fields have been correctly populated. Now let's think about this for a moment. This means that we can test locally that modulo the correct runtime information being provided, which we'll come to, the configuration is consistent and complete with respect to the configuration that's actually defined by our Go program. This is the shifting left that the title of this talk is referring to. This means we can write our Go program such that it's defined only in terms of the configuration type that it needs and the ability to read environment variables. Here's why, how we actually might write that, uh, that, that function in, in, our, in our service. So this function is in a package that we import from all our services. It knows our particular conventions for where to find configuration. You might see that there's a bootstrapping problem here. We're saying, we've said that configuration can come from multiple possible sources, but then how does this function work? The answer is, we have to start somewhere. In our case, we provide the queue configuration in a config environment variable, but it would be easy to use a different convention, more appropriate for your own situation. If we were okay with deploying an image each time our configuration changed, we could even compile it into the Go executable. The important thing is that this function is not a moving part. It's something we can test well, use consistently across services, and almost never changes which contrasts it with other parts of the configuration and gives us enough confidence to be happy. Uh, a proper introduction to the Go Q API is out of scope for this talk, but let's describe this briefly just so you get an idea. This function gets the env config environment variable, parses it, parses it as Q, merges the environment variables into runtime.env, extracts the configuration, which is now hopefully complete, from the config field, and then decodes it into the destination, much like unmarshal JSON would. So we've managed to join up runtime with the top level configuration in principle, but how do we get assurance that the runtime values themselves are all present and correct when the service is deployed? Well, it turns out all the information is already available in our configuration or can be easily added. We know the names of the set of services that must be deployed. We know the name of the image that's required for each service and can build the requisite Go binary for it and bundle it into an image. We can use that as a source of truth for creating images to push to a registry, for actually associating those images with their service-specific configuration and for writing more shifted left style tests. E even though we don't have direct control over the runtime environment passed to the program, because that's down to our cloud, cloud provider, 
we can still exert indirect control. For example, we can find out the names of the environment variables required, infer from those the secrets required by the configuration, and use that information when deploying. So here's an example of that, not fully fleshed out because it would take too much time. You could, we can decode the configuration into Go, walk those environment variable names, even though we don't know the values for them yet, and use those to create the actual command that we use to deploy the service. So this is that actually, you know, that's, there's a gcloud run, but it could be pushing something to your Kubernetes um, configuration or whatever. At this point, we can write a test that can check that, given the runtime information we're going to deploy with, our services configuration is complete and consistent. This closes the loop. It gives us confidence that all our configuration is self-consistent, consistent with the actual Go code being deployed, and consistent with values that will be provided later at runtime. At this point, I believe we've ticked off all our requirements. The final one being that we can now get confidence that, as far as possible, even in the presence of runtime provided information, our configuration should be consistent. To summarize the example I've shown you, we've used the queue tool to derive a queue schema directly from Go code. We've incorporated that into a larger configuration suitable for multiple services. We've used that configuration as a source for other deployment operations too. So what do we get for all that, from all that? It means we can easily comply constraints across multiple services. We can run local tests that check consistency in ways that wouldn't have been possible otherwise. Shifting, implicitly shifting those Go types leftwards via queue all the way back to your local machine, hence the talk title. Now, although we've been focusing something small in scale here, a single service, I hope I've shown how this could be applicable to a much larger deployment. In particular, in the situation I talked about at the beginning of this talk, with multiple services, multiple developers and maintainers, all operating across a highly heterogeneous environment, I believe Q can help in all kinds of ways. It makes it possible to apply constraints across whatever aspects of the configuration we care about. This includes incremental configuration hardening, where we can apply constraints in parallel with existing setup, gradually moving towards a more declarative, constraint-based approach. We can apply policies, too, and those policies can be applied later if we wish, because the predictable merging properties of Q means it's easy to split up across different aspects of the deployment, whether that might be deployment stages, organizational divisions, or just for convenience or ease of maintenance. And for reasons of time, I haven't even talked about the ways that Q makes it easy to remove redundancy in your configuration. After all this talk of Q, you might be wondering where it's at. It's in use in lots of ways by, in production by multiple companies. We're super happy with that, but there's, there's way much more to come. It's backed by a company with a dev team working full-time on new features. And some notable ones include module support, the ability to publish and import code, new code from the network, WASM, we believe that configuration itself shouldn't contain complex computation. Q is great for glue, but for more involved calculations, other languages are more appropriate. We plan to support calling into other languages by supporting WASM. And Q supports Go really well, but we plan on making it easy to integrate Q evaluation in other languages too. And editor support for languages is really important and improves developer experience considerably. And we're working on making all of that into a clear public roadmap for the future. Thank you very much. Any questions? Any questions? Hello, thank you very much for the talk. It was very interesting. Um, I've got a question. What would be the purpose or the benefit, rather, of using Q over using a uh, general configuration library in Go, like Viper or Conf? Those, most of the time, provide you with the possibility to 
uh, have the structures defined in Go, uh, to write integration tests that would check them, to override using environment variables and consider multiple sources of uh, configuration. So why would one choose Q over one of the existing frameworks? So I'd say that it enables you to have a nice schema for, but if you use something like Viper, you don't generally have a nice schema that represents your, your Vi Viper input. And that, as I perhaps demonstrated, uh, is, is actually really nice for writing properties across that schema, across services. Um, and also, it's talking about that's maybe one way of consuming the configuration, but here we're talking about producing the configuration, and the Go, uh, the Go library doesn't really help there at all, I'd say. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk, super interesting tech. Um, we really like to keep our secrets in our repository as well, but encrypted. We use uh, Mozilla SOPS, or S-O-P-S for that. Is there support or some other alternative to do this uh, using Q? So Q doesn't have direct support for secrets like that, but it's just, in the end, it's just configuration data, right? So, um, and, and I'd say that, you know, if you, if Putting secrets in your configuration works great if you're just deploying to one place with a common set of, with one secret for, but if you're deploying to multiple places with different secrets in different places, that's not ideal, right? And, and, and the, where I'm talking secrets here, it's really just a placeholder for any information that might, you might only know later. So I've used that as a demonstration. I think it's quite a good example, but I, there are lots of other possible examples too um, of it. So it's, it's more an example of a general principle. Thanks for sharing, Raj. Um, my question is, so how do you see Q working with other types of languages like, like for example, uh, Terraform or CDK or those other sorts of things? Uh, so it depends very much on which language you're talking about. Um, there's definitely been some work. We've done some work integrating Q with Terraform. And, and actually, this because Terraform has its own sort of schema kind of language, um, which is kind of ad hoc and, uh, and, and like, there are ways to transform that into Q. So when I talked about Q being a kind of lingua franca, that's the kind of thing. It's not just about data formats like JSON and YAML, but also schema formats like, Terra, like Terraforms and like JSON schema and that sort of thing. So we, we see that the two can coexist. And one of the really nice things about Q is that it can apply independent of the other thing, you can use it alongside tech, existing tech, and because it, it's kind of aspect-oriented nature, it can um, it can be useful even without without getting rid of your existing tech. It's not necessarily a replacement. It's uh, you know it, it's uh, it's something that can work alongside things as well. Thank you. I liked how you showed that configuration could be invalid sometimes, and we saw the error messages. When the errors are more complex, maybe like different schemas conflicting, is it still easy to find the reason and to debug or, and solve it? So, and especially it, in a larger project. It's, yeah. it's, quite good to, it, it's quite good at pointing out all the places where, where that feed into the errors that happened, which is, which is super nice. But also, I will admit, there is lots of work to be done, like pr producing good error messages, in this case, is, 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 is a hard problem, right? So there's definitely more work to be done. Um, but you do get to see all the places, but maybe there's too much information, right? So what you want is sometimes less information that points to the place that you might actually need to change to fix it, right? That's, that's, that would be the great thing, you know? Oh, tell, me, tell me what I can change to fix it. Um, but it's... Uh, it, it, you know, just like Go error messages, right? It's, um, you know, it do, doesn't necessarily tell you everything, but it tells you what, what you, it, you know, it helps a lot. And, and just having those conflicts, 
is, is so nice, right? It, it, you can, you know, it's like static typing, but for your configuration at whatever level you want. Uh, and, uh, you know, not necessarily, it, it gets you, it, you can, it, it'll check even, the, even when it's incomplete, basically. So, uh, which is super nice. Hope that helps. So you, you've shown has has um, how we can uh, from type single um, use Q to generate a configuration um, that somehow satisfies those uh, types. I'm wondering um, um, since we can have configuration that ends up in the program at runtime that doesn't come from Q. I'm wondering if uh, Q supports already or plan to support some some tooling to generate validation inside Go in order for the input that arrives at the program to satisfy the schema in Q. Uh, yeah, as it happens, there are ways that you can uh, compile your Q into V validation that can be done in Go, and, and in fact, the uh, if I've understood your correct question correctly, um, in fact, that the uh, the function of the Go function I I, I demonstrated showed earlier that that's actually doing that. So that's using a Q schema inside your Go to validate uh, the, the the schema. So it's actually using Q from from Go to validate an ex uh, some some source of truth. Um, is that is that Answer your question a bit. Sorry. Satisfy them. That, uh, if you can have some code generated to satisfy the Q schema constraints, uh, because the, the the code you're showing yeah, it takes up um, a JSON and full JSON at the end of the day, but we can have um, Q generate for us. I don't know, some sort of M file with, with the configuration variable in another format. I'm wondering if the final type, so it, we cannot change Go, so a struct can define some fields that at the end they can be null, for example, nil. Uh, I'm wondering if uh, Q can provide some generation, some tooling to generate code that validates those type against the, the schema without having JSON in, in between, let's say, with, where those types could be populated with any other mean, like also run um, so uh, you, assignments. So you're talking about validation without actually having some JSON representation? Yes. Um, yes, there is something that does that, but it's not, I mean, there's lots of possibilities. I mean, there, we have something that does that. I haven't really used it much, in, in, in honestly. Um, but I think that's a, that is an interesting uh, that is an interesting use case. Um, yeah. I'm sorry, we have to wrap this up. Um, thank you again, Roger, and uh, I'm sure you'll find it. <laughs>